Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, welcome to the Cisco Sponsor Track Room. My name is Gary, and I'm going to be the host for all five sessions here today. Um, hope you can join us for the other four, if they make sense for what you're looking for. Um, we're going to kick off the day with uh, a great session on the MetaCloud solution. Uh, MetaCloud, OpenStack, and the Enterprise. We've got three uh, members of our team who are going to be giving our presentation today. Are we starting with George? Yes. Okay, we're going to start it off with George Sieb, who is a systems engineer at Cisco. We're going to jump into Jason, That's right. who is one of our uh, software solution architects, and Chris Revere is going to bring up the rear. Oh, I, I hadn't even planned that, but that worked out really well. Um, so with that being said, gentlemen, take it away. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Good morning, everyone. So we're going to talk to you today about MetaCloud and how it fits in in the enterprise and some lessons learned. But uh, is this working? Yeah. So quickly, I'm going to go over kind of how uh, Cisco is approaching the portfolio in this space. And then we're going to dive into the kind of the meat of the topic, and that's the inter enterprise focus uh, cloud. And then finally, we'll have some time at the end for, for some questions. So please uh, uh, save those up and come up with some good questions and stump these guys. Um, so when uh, Cisco was looking at the cloud space and, um, and, and how we approached it, we asked the um, IDC to go out and really dig deep uh, with, with customers, and they actually were able to talk to over 11,000 uh, uh, excuse me, directors and above um, about their cloud implementation. And um, they then focused in on 6,000 of those and went really deep. And kind of what they saw was there's a difference between a lot of people who are doing ad hoc implementations and spending a lot of budget in implementing uh, hybrid clouds and those that uh, have optimized cloud. And you can kind of see some of the numbers here with um, you know, people being able to double the amount of budget that goes strategic that really focuses on that top line revenue growth. And that's by moving up the stack um, and really being able to do cloud native and focus on the, the applications. And so some commonalities, some, some good news for all of us, at least here, is that they saw a strong correlation of those that are doing uh, OpenStack and having these optimized cloud. And so, uh, as you can see, hybrid cloud was a strong correlation. Uh, very high uh, percentage of them are doing DevOps and cloud native and are doing fog computing as well and extending that cloud out to the edge, right into the IoT. The downside is only 3% of those companies surveyed really had that optimized cloud. And so they weren't able, most companies weren't able to focus on that cloud native space because they're still trying to get the infrastructure working, right? Um, so Cisco's strategy really is around uh, enabling that, uh, getting to that optimized cloud uh, and enabling customers to focus on cloud native and applications. And so another piece that, uh, uh, the survey drew out on those optimized clouds is the secure hybrid cloud. And so security is in Cisco's DNA. And um, so we see no matter what your environment, whether you're looking to deploy um, on-premise or um, public, that security uh, needs to be part of that uh, strategy. So two avenues that Cisco is, uh, you know, kind of this encompasses. Obviously, build it yourself. Uh, we believe that a lot of customers are able to successfully do that, and a lot of customers want to do that. And so Cisco supports that with a lot of, uh, a lot of technologies from switching our Nexus line that integrates well with uh, OpenStack. Uh, from a security standpoint, our uh, firepower enable next generation firewall, et cetera. Um, we also have. Uh, uh, validated designs that we've done in conjunction with uh, the likes of Red Hat uh, to, to work with our networking and UCS solutions. But a lot of, uh, a lot of customers also want to buy their, um, 
uh, their cloud environment. And we work through partners, and then we also have the MetaCloud offering. Um, so just at a high level, some of the, the big portfolio items. Um, if you look at the hybrid cloud solutions, we have the uh, Cloud Center, uh, uh, which is the formerly Clicker uh, application. And that's really about moving workloads between multi-clouds and hybrid clouds. Um, and then the MetaCloud offering, which we're going to kind of dive deeper in here, which is that uh, fully managed uh, private cloud offering. And then we look at our managed platforms, such as Meraki. And this is one of the most successful, um, fastest growing businesses that Cisco has ever launched. Um, and it's really about simplicity for, the, uh, for deployment and management, but also being able to extract that data and useful data about all of those end devices. Um, so analytics is obviously uh, a top of mind and kind of encompasses all of these. Um, and we have products like Tetration, which allows you to uh, pull that analytics, use machine learning to do uh, intelligent things, do forensic type activities on all that data. And then, of course, we have plenty of SaaS offerings. Um, OpenDNS, uh, many of you may use. Um, Cisco WebEx, a collaboration tool, um, is a, a SaaS offering. And finally, our Spark uh, collaboration tool. So that kind of covers the portfolio. Let's focus down into the MetaCloud piece. And we'll have Jason kick that off. All right. Thank you. You bet. Good morning, Thanks. everybody. Um, so uh, MetaCloud, OpenStack for the enterprise. Um, it, it's not just a tagline, uh, even though it's on a, on a PowerPoint. This next section is not about architecture or anything like that. We're going to get into some technical depth about uh, the reality, what we mean by OpenStack for the enterprise, right? We, we kind of debated on the name of this. You could call it carrier grade, uh, OpenStack, OpenStack for, for grown-ups, you know, not your dad's OpenStack. But we'll really take a look at what differentiates us uh, in the enterprise space and things that we do that uh, essentially nobody else, uh, nobody else does. So the, the reality with cloud adoption and, and part of the reason OpenStack has gotten uh, a, a slow enterprise uh, adoption and some black eyes in the enterprise space is that um, everybody you know, rushed off to a, a cloud strat strategy. OpenStack being the Linux of the cloud um, it, you know, was the, the shops that embraced open source technology. Uh, a lot of DIY, you know, do-it-yourself um, science experiments uh, came up and there were a lot of failures. There's this high level of expectations like we're going to get cloud, our, our time to market and time to value is going to be so much better. Um, you know, DevOps and pipelines and, and tool chains and it's going to be you know, this panacea. Um, so like the, you know, the Ferrari uh, assembly line was kind of where the, the bar was, was set. Um, unfortunately, when most enterprises um, went to uh, go and try and execute on that model, and we had a talk yesterday about BrokenStack, all of these complexities, right, um, the, the staffing, the operational model, um, the, the technical hurdles, the, the culture and the dogma and all that stuff, so you end up uh, what enterprises really want versus what they get. We're at, a, we're at a kind of an inflection point uh, in OpenStack adoption. We, we've passed the tipping point of viability, but we are at a point where people are kind of rebooting their, their strategy. Um, so everybody's seen this slide probably you know, several hundred times. 95% of private clouds fail. Um, so what makes MetaCloud different? And I'm going to go through these fast, and we'll go you know, end each one in depth later. But uh, consumption model, uh, you know, DIY versus uh, distro-based. Um, versus a, a fully managed offering. We'll take a look, a, a close look at the control plane, um, networking and storage, some things that we do different there for both scale uh, and stability and availability, um, and, and dig into deeper around what we mean by enterprise scale, how, how far we scale, how we, you know, how we do some of that scaling. Look at SLA and the uh, stability of the cloud. Uh, we'll look at TCO, ROI use cases, uh, regulatory as well. Um, how we do upgrades and updates, um, and uh, finally, we'll take a look at curation and telemetry and visibility, some enhancements that we've done to um, OpenStack in, in general. So before we get into the differentiating factors of um, MetaCloud, we'll just take a, um, you know, 30 seconds here to 
take a look at what MetaCloud is. And in summary, if you roll up all of the MetaCloud um, you know, presentation decks, it's kind of, an, I, I describe it in kind of four different uh, buckets, right? It's an OpenStack powered uh, private cloud uh, that Cisco uh, got through an acquisition and about two years ago now, November, um, when they acquired MetaCloud. You might remember it as uh, Cisco OpenStack private cloud, uh, Metapod, and now we're back to, to MetaCloud. So we have a we have kind of a CI/CD on our on our naming uh, convention for for MetaCloud, but I think we're we're staying with MetaCloud now. Um, so, it's a solution that's deployed behind your firewall, uh, your data center, a, a colo data center, or you know a partner DC uh, of, of your choice are working with us. Uh, fully managed by Cisco, Four Nines platform uh, uptime SLA, um, not just the API but the but the entire platform, uh, delivered as a service. So. From planning, so we're, we're very prescriptive and opinionated about how we deploy and support and manage and operate OpenStack. Uh, yet we're, we're, at the same time, we're very consultative and collaborative about how we, how we size it, uh, helping you with uh, aggregates and, and zones and uh, metadata and flavors and uh, you know, creating tiers of storage and things. So there's a lot of flexibility in the solution uh, where we can, can have it and a lot of uh, opinionated configurations uh, where we need to um, you know, be diligent in that space to maintain the SLA. But from the, from the planning stage through the design and sizing, uh, through deployment, uh, the, the monitoring and management uh, of the solution after it's in, uh, and then maintenance and capacity planning and, and growth. Um, so we'll look at uh, some of the curation of that, but some of the how, how we do the management and monitoring uh, of that. But it is a it's really a concierge um, service. I don't have the slides here, but truly, uh, after I've done customer deployments, I get added um, to the list of you know tickets between the customer and our ops team. And there's the the visibility that we have into the system. You'll see things like you know uh, DIM six on hypervisor twelve is is failing. We'd like to migrate all of your VMs uh, off of that and, and tag that hypervisor out of the scheduler and, and triage that and, and repair that. So we have very deep level of visibility um, where we can gather this data and, and, and you know, do, uh, execute on it as well. So the first thing we talked about was the OpenStack consumption model. So it really falls into three buckets. There's do-it-yourself OpenStack, uh, an OpenStack distro, or Cisco MetaCloud, which is a fully managed uh, distribution. With each of those, you look at things like SLA, typically no on the first two, and we offer the, the four nines SLA. Um, you know, production timeline from uh, unpredictable to more predictable uh, to you know, the most predictable uh, of how we do updates and upgrades and, and how we uh, uh, deliver that as a service uh, for you. And the operational complexity uh, from high to, uh, to medium to low with, with OpenStack. Um, so, the OpenStack, I mean, the, the consumption model is more easy for enterprises to consume. You don't have to find staff, acquire staff, uh, retain staff, uh, worry about poaching uh, or, or pay disparity or things like that. With a, you know, with a delivered as a service uh, private cloud, what makes this different is that it's turnkey. Um, it's delivered as a service. We can have, um, once the hardware is up and accessible, um, and Chris will go through the control plane and, and look at some of the out-of-band things, but once our hardware is accessible, we can have the uh, entire system you know, deployed, configured, and turned over in, in 10 business days, or uh, roughly two weeks uh, or less. Uh, again, no training cost for existing staff. If your cloud admin or cloud operator can log into AWS and, and create VMs, I mean, that's the user experience that we're going for uh, around when we deploy private cloud on, on your site. So uh, again, no risk of having your talent poached. Uh, no lost time with hiring or, or training, and this is a part of the delivered as a service uh, model. No, no new talent acquisition or cost. Um, Chris is going to come up and talk about some of the technical details around the control plane. Thanks, Jason. Um, so we've we've talked about MetaCloud at a, at a high level, but to kind of start to dive a little bit deeper into it, we're going to take a look at the architecture. Um, so first and foremost, we have the MetaCloud control plane. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail to describe that. Um, to start off, we have two Cisco ASRs that are essentially responsible for the routing, for any routing that takes place across the cluster. Um, there's two Nexus 9Ks for essentially the switching fabric. There's an ISR 2901, which is essentially hooking us up to the outside world via out-of-band connection 
to our MetaCloud Meta NOC Center, where we're able to monitor the environment, do the provisioning, et cetera. And one thing to note is that this is a very robust HA configuration. And there's three UCS servers, which are running the majority of the OpenStack services in a very HA manner. So what do I mean by that? You can essentially have any sort of failure here. Um, and the cloud will still be operational. All the APIs will be functional. So we have a 4.9 SLA, as was previously mentioned. And what we're essentially doing is we're guaranteeing you know, the operation of the cloud, the provisioning of VMs, um, you know, the network running smoothly. And we actually take it a level further with our operations team, and we're actually automating a number of synthetic transactions, doing things like spinning up virtual machines on a regular basis and, and spinning it down. So we're always monitoring that environment, making sure that everything's operational, and that's how we can help ensure a 4.9 SLA. The other thing that I think is a bit quite unique is this 4.9 SLA is across the entire stack. So what does that mean? It's, it's a managed service. Um, if you look at this control plane right here, this is essentially you know, Cisco prescribed. Uh, Cisco is managing the network, the, you know, the switching, the routing, the, Cis the three UCS servers that are running the OpenStack services. Cisco is responsible for those. It's essentially Cisco OpenStack. And so Cisco is basically on the hook for everything. So one of the things that I think is attractive about this is the customers get one finger to point, right? Anything starts to happen, it's a network issue, it's an OpenStack issue, it's any sort of hardware issue, you get one number to call. You don't have to worry about, oh, let me contact the OpenStack vendor or maybe the network vendor who's making my servers. You get one number to call. Now, this control plane right here, extremely scalable and robust, but it doesn't actually have any compute or storage capacity. And that's what I've just introduced down here. So this is where we have the hypervisors, starting with um, you know, as little as seven hypervisor nodes. And this configuration here can scale up to 400 physical hypervisors for an availability zone. We simply add a pair of switches to accommodate 40 servers at a time. So it's a very robust, scalable architecture. And the nice thing about these hypervisor nodes, while we're prescriptive on the control plane for the hypervisor nodes, um, you can actually bring your own server. We're not picky there what vendor it is, or obviously there's UCS servers. There's a number of different storage options that are available. So first and foremost, there's just ephemeral storage, where whatever kind of drives we have in these servers, we just treat you know, the local ephemeral storages. Uh, you have instances, any sort of outage, you lose the data on that, on that specific node. Uh, we also have the converged block storage, where we use Ceph. And this, again, is completely managed by Cisco as part of the solution. So you don't have to worry about the best practices of configuring Ceph for performance, et cetera. Um, Jason will actually go into a little bit de more detail later on that. We also have you know, external block storage options where we work with a number of different vendors here, including um, SolidFire, um, NetApp, Pure Storage, Nimble Storage. And we've actually, as we've done some of our testing, we've encountered you know, some scalability issues at certain points, and we're able to tune that to accommodate the performance um, when we go through our like, testing phase. So we've actually made sure that when any services are deployed for the storage, you're assured that it's going to be completely scalable, reliable. You don't have to worry about you know, how many nodes you're adding. You know, are things going to continue to perform? And we've recently added an object storage capability via partnering with SwiftStack. So really, depending on your storage options, and like Jason mentioned at the beginning, we'll actually work with you as a team to understand what are your storage options, you know, what are your different networking options, and we'll make sure that we build the cloud you know, right the first time around. So what, is that, what do I mean? We talked a little bit about the networking, where essentially you know, the routers are HSRP. Um, you know, the Nexus is the 9Ks are configured, very HA. You can have any sort of failure in that control plane, whether it be you know, a router going down, power, lost CPU, et cetera, and the cloud will continue to operate 100%. And what that actually buys us in the networking, this is just a, kind of a simple screenshot from, uh, from Horizon. And what you can actually see here is I have a virtual router here, which is connected to my external public network. And these different colors just represent different virtual networks that I've set up. And I've just taken a screenshot of one specific, one specific network here. And you can actually see there's four interfaces on this virtual router. Um, one of those is obviously the public interface. And then we actually have three additional interfaces for that, for that network. And what that actually is doing on the back end is that's associated with the three interfaces are tied to two physical links. 
So each hypervisor is connected to both switches, and then both the switches being connected to the router, router, whatever your preference is. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is essentially very robust HA, and you know, almost like you, if you were paying attention in the you know the keynote the first day when Mark went up there and you know cut scissors, started cutting cables. Whereas you know I think that redundancy was being handled at the software level to some degree. We actually already have some of that functionality baked in here. So at any point in time, everything's completely redundant. Uh, this is also extremely scalable as being hardware-based. So we kind of call it hardware-assisted neutron by offloading the networking to the routers. So just as an example, you could have easily you know, a couple hundred hypervisors, each running you know, 50 instances or so, a number of connections, and we can easily support 200 thousand flows, significantly more than that, and that's something that you're not going to typically see in a software-implemented neutron solution. And actually, I think Jason has some more interesting stories on the storage, so stay flip around. it over to him for a few. It's just one slide, so stay around. Um, yeah, so what, uh, Chris is going to talk about curation a little bit later and how we select projects and how we augment uh, uh, OpenStack and fix some of these gaps, uh, particularly around r around scale and stability. But as he's saying, um, I'm not sure I, who who in the room has deployed OpenStack themselves in, in a lab or in prod or in dev. Okay, so quite quite a few of you. Um, not sure if you've you've tried a software only model uh, for Neutron and and how well that's worked or how well you've you've load tested that. Um, but what we what we found was that since MetaCloud's been around um, since 2011, you know, we had customers on uh, Nova. We already had customers um, at multiple hundred hypervisors per AZ. When we went to Neutron, we had to adhere to that uh, level of scale that was in Nova. We had to do that with, with Neutron. And, they, and, the, and the two just don't you know, scale the same. There's, there's challenges there. But um, with Neutron, putting hundreds of thousands of flows in a software-only model if you haven't tried it yet, um, it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, I mean, you, there's things that should be up in the ASICs, uh, and that's what, we're, that's what we're doing here. Similarly with Ceph, um, you know, Chris mentioned the control plane. We have, we have a bunch of uh, uh, sender drivers that are supported and cross-certified, and, and we're finding things like uh, the solid fire, uh, image caching. Um, the majority of this code we're contributing back to uh, trunk. When we find uh, an, an issue with the sender driver, with solid fire, and, and glance, um, we're fixing that and we're, we're putting it back in, in trunk. We're still maintaining the Cisco powered uh, certification. So we're, this is not a, this is not VIO. This is not a locked in version of OpenStack. We're still you know, maintaining trunk API parity. Um, but if you, you look at storage, it's another example where um, there's a lot of uh, DIY uh, install guides and uh, our competitors are, are doing Ceph. And what you'll see in a centralized, most, most of what those recommend is a centralized Ceph model, so three, three or five nodes of, of Ceph. Again, running probably works okay in a 20 node, you know, maybe up to a 50 node hypervisor model. And in, in a centralized Ceph model, you take three to five, typically three to five nodes um, dedicated to, to Ceph. Similar in Neutron, you might have dedicated uh, software nodes for, for Neutron, but you have dedicated Ceph nodes. Um, not an uncommon configuration is to put 50 to 60, you know, four to six terabyte drives in that three node cluster, each of those running um, 320 terabytes each. Again, not sure if you've tried a failover scenario with nearly a petabyte of Ceph uh, and one node goes down and you're stuck with replication uh, traffic on those two nodes. Oddly enough, it's not the network bandwidth that kills it, it's the CPU that spikes trying to catch up with uh, figuring out which blocks to replicate. And essentially the, the, the box Log, you can't even log into it. The CPU goes to 100% for an indefinite period of time while it's trying to trying to rebalance that. Uh, alternatively, the way we do Ceph is a lot more work on our end, uh, but it's really the only way to, to deploy it at scale and stability, which is a fully distributed model of Ceph. Uh, when we do Ceph, every time you add a compute node, you're adding the raw storage um, for that node uh, to the cluster, and we're putting two 480 gig performance SSDs on the front of that for, for journal and cache. Um, and what you end up with is a much smaller failure domain. Um, and so in model A, which um, a lot of folks are doing today, and again, they haven't run into issues if you're running you know, 25 hypervisor clouds, but so three nodes, 320 terabytes per node. 
the 10 32T boxes that you're seeing on the right, it represents only one of those 320 node um, uh, Ceph, cluster, or Ceph nodes on the left. So imagine, you know, it, it's kind of a moot point. Would you rather be reading and writing to 30 nodes with a 32 terabyte failure domain with a terabyte of cache on, on each end with, you know, two 10 gig connections per, or have that dedicated on three nodes? Model on the left is much easier to deploy, obviously. Uh, model on the right actually works um, at scale, so. Just kind of taking a little bit of a step back, um, looking at the enterprise and scalability, we talked in a little, little bit of detail about how a single availability zone with our control plane can scale upwards of 400 physical nodes per an availability zone. Um, with that 4.9 SLA, again, across the entire stack, uh, looking a little bit into our success rate, I think this is an interesting um, fact. We talked about at the beginning how you know, Gartner said 95% of private clouds fail. Um, we actually have a 0% meta cloud churn rate, which I think is actually quite unique. So of all the deployments that we've done where we've actually got meta cloud up and running, we haven't lost a single customer. Um, in fact, a number of our customers have you know, scaled out additional hundreds of nodes across the different you know, multiple availability zones, different geographies. So I think that's kind of one of the key statistics here. And in terms of just the, you know, in general ROI, we have one of our, one of our customers has upwards of 400 nodes running big data workloads with Hadoop. They actually realized five, X, five times capacity um, for less cost than when they were previously with AWS. In terms of the upgrades and updates, uh, I think this is another differentiator, is that we've had in-place upgrades since uh, the Grizzly release. So really we have customers that have maybe started with Grizzly and we've now, most recently now we're at, um, our, we're based on Red Hat OSP 8 um, with, the Liberty, with the Liberty release. But basically you're guaranteed when you have MetaCloud, you're guaranteed that you're gonna be fully supported in terms of we're able to even upgrade customers from Nova to Neutron and now moving people forward. Um, but really essentially minimal downtime seamless updates and upgrades. We tend to be about six months behind the trunk. Um, it gives us the ability to, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but more of our curated OpenStack. Um, it gives us that ability as well as kind of six to eight milestone releases, six to eight week milestone releases for things like patches and we'll do you know, critical security updates, et cetera. And with regards to, we're now um, SOC, SOC 1 compliant, uh, SOC 2 compliant, um, ISO 27001 compliant, uh, PC, will be PCI compliant very soon and with Ernst and Young auditing us for that. Now what do we mean by the curation? We've talked about that a little bit. Um, this is an example, not sure if many of you have seen, I think it was in Tokyo they announced, the OpenStack Foundation announced the Project Navigator um, on the website. So this is actually from openstack.org. But what I think is absolutely phenomenal about this is they list the maturity of the various OpenStack projects out there, right? So we've seen there's, you know, so many new projects, some have, you know, mascots, et cetera, they're coming out all the time. And so what they do is there's actually various ways to rank these projects. Uh, so if you look at something like, and we get this all the time when we're, when we're talking to prospects, people say, oh, I want, I want Zakar, you know, I need that messaging service for my cloud. And, you know, you pull this up and you say, all right, let's look at the maturity level as rated by the foundation and you know, all the users. It's essentially, you know, the maturity is one out of eight, probably not the most mature module out there. Um, hoping the Zakar PTL isn't in here. <laughs> uh, and we also look at things like, you know, the age, how long has that module been around, right? Zakar has been around two years and the adoption rate is a whopping 1%. So we actually see that as there's introducing some risk in your environment if you're actually building a cloud maybe it's DIY, et cetera, and you're saying, okay, I want to use this module, 1% of the community is using it, right? Are you prepared to support that? Are you, you know, how are you going to handle updates for that, patching for that? How's that going to interoperate with the other modules? And so that's actually something to consider. Whereas if you look at something like, you know, Nova Horizon, adopted by pretty much everyone, extremely mature, eight out of eight, and it's been around since the dawn of OpenStack. So what we've actually done is we've taken all that information with the history that we've had running thousands of hypervisors for a wide variety of you know, global clients, and we've actually said, okay, we're gonna, let's analyze all that data. This is what's included in the MetaCloud offering. 
So you'll notice that it's actually a little bit of a subset of all the different modules. Um, obviously, we add you know, more and more over time based on customer feedback, the maturity of the modules, et cetera. Um, but the idea is that we're only deploying these stable configs of mature models. And because we're you know, maybe lagging by six months, it kind of gives us time to see what modules are being adopted. Um, you know, can we make improvements to those? Are those really stable and robust? And this is actually how we're able to offer that, that 4.9 SLA across the entire stack. So basically, you're assured that whatever functionality you're doing in your cloud, there's that, there's that 4.9 SLA that we're constantly monitoring, and you're guaranteed that all these are going to work and continue to work in a scalable fashion as your cloud grows. We talked a little bit about the neutron, the neutron networking, so how we've kind of differentiated ourselves there is it's really the hardware system model we think is much more robust, you know, easily scaling hundreds of thousands of flows. Uh, instead of solometer, with regards to the telemetry and visibility, we can actually show you how we've done extensive modification to Horizon to provide our clients visibility into the hypervisors, the control plane, the VM performance, etc. So we've actually opted, and you can see here that Solometer is not the most mature module as well. And we've managed to do this while maintaining you know, full certification with the, with the OpenStack Foundation. So we start looking at the enhancements to the telemetry to give you some examples that we just thought it'd be a good idea to show some of the screenshots. So as I mentioned, we've extensively modified the Horizon dashboard. So when you spin up an instance, we are actually monitoring that instance, and the users can see things like CPU, disk, IO metrics over various periods of time. And we actually maintain that data for a year. So anytime you've launched an instance, you know, lots of times you're troubleshooting things. You, you don't know what apps the customer might be running within specific instances. You can get that you know, detailed view of the performance of the virtual machine. Uh, storage. I think storage is quite an interesting one. Um, when I first started using OpenStack, I was kind of baffled that I couldn't figure out how much Ceph was used and available. Um, and then if you manage to you know, fill it up via using a lot of the space or you have some sort of failure, it's not the most pleasant experience. Um, so we actually provide complete visibility into the storage. And this is supplemented with us monitoring hundreds and hundreds of probes of networks in the environment, and we're getting alerts on the back end. So if we start to see an anomaly or a hardware failure, our ops team 24-7 is going to get alerted on that and proactively take action. But in addition to that, we're going to be providing you visibility into that environment yourself. So whether whatever sort of storage you can have, you can monitor the OSDs, the performance, are they up, down, et cetera. As well as visibility into the controller and hypervisor metrics. So while it's, while it's a managed service, we're still providing you know, pretty much complete visibility into those controller and hypervisor nodes. So you can see here, I can easily see how much physical memory is in the machine, um, what's the CPU stats, the memory utilization, and this is for the actual bare metal, for the bare metal OS that we're looking at here. Dr drilling down into specific servers, we can see you know, a system level overview, again, for either controller or hypervisor. We're actually able to see things like you know, uptime, CPU, the different NICs, how much data has been transferred for those NICs. Uh, the disk usage, et cetera, the different partitions, how much space is free available, as well as things like you know, the network details, um, which NICs have you know, packet errors, drops, et cetera. The running processes on a specific machine as well, as well as the disk, the disk details, driving into each one of these. So we can actually look at the individual partitions you know, here we can see how much space for each mount point, how much space is free, used, et cetera. And what, one of the things that's more interesting with this is taking this kind of to the next level, because I mentioned we're you know, monitoring hundreds and hundreds of metrics, we actually provide you the ability to extend that visibility by integrating it in with your own tools. So using something like uh, Grafana, here's an example of kind of a bespoke dashboard that we've been able to build if I want to look into specific metrics within my environment. So now I can use this to kind of integrate with my existing operational tools. And I can actually see here we have a detailed view of MHV. That's one of our hypervisors. I can actually drill down and say, OK, I want to look at a chart of the different types of CPU and that performance over time. And again, over any sort of period of time. So I can then set bespoke alerts 
et cetera, on that, as well as things like load average or something that I think is pretty cool is just looking at kind of a simple example, but just looking at the different types of flavors that are in use. So as an admin of my cloud, I can see, okay, I have, you know, X hundred VMs. I can quickly see, you know, how many of those are large, tiny, et cetera, when those were launched. So that's just one example of the kind of bespoke, bespoke dashboards. And Jason, I will let you wrap it up. Yep. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that you saw on the slide, uh, so we keep that data for a year. Um, some of the folks deploying Solometer today for telemetry, they're, de they're able to deploy it in production, but because Solometer is writing back uh, to SQL into a time series database, um, you end up with a, both a capacity and a load issue. So they either, either both reduce the number of metrics they're collecting or only keep the data for uh, a few days at a time uh, with a, with a, a real-time series database to be able to keep that for a year. Um, just a quick call out on that. So in summary, went, went through the Cisco Cloud portfolio at a, at a high level, uh, focused on MetaCloud differentiation, um, particularly the architecture, uh, the scale enhancements, uh, visibility, or, or curation uh, process. Uh, we've got about five minutes um, for questions. This is our, um, not John Kelly, that was from yesterday, George, <laughs> George Seib, <laughs> we'll, we'll put his, yes, he, he goes by John as well. Uh, so so we, we do have time for a couple of minutes yep. for Q&A, any questions? Yep. Okay, you got, a booming, <laughs> you got a booming voice, okay. <laughs> So to, today we um, certified center drivers for pure, uh, nimble, uh, generic NFS driver, uh, NetApp, and SolidFire. Um, those were, were but, and not for, that's for Block, and then SwiftStack for, for object storage. Um, SolidFire has been with us the, the longest. We have the most customers deployed on that. Um, but we, our roadmap a lot of time is driven by uh, our customers. Uh, we'll start talking to um, someone and they'll say, you know, we want, I, I, I love the MetaCloud idea, but I, I really like Pure, or we already have an existing uh, investment in, in Nimble, and uh, our team will go through and look at the driver and the maturity of it. Um, I mean, look at the code. Uh, like in the case of Pure and Nimble and SolidFire, we'll have, um, you know, we'll deploy a MetaCloud dev environment to them, or they'll deploy gear on site for us, and we'll go through a whole certification process. Um, we do an on-site certification if someone wants to deploy quickly, and then it, that kind of matures to um, a true uh, certified driver where we're doing cross-certification on every release and, and things like that. So all the ones that you see up there are you know, deployed in production today. Long answer, but I, yeah, Ceph and Firmal, pure solid fire. Good. Yeah. Right. There you go. Yes. Your voice is Uh, you seem to have uh, removed ciliometer, so how does your heat auto-scaling work? Ah, good question. Um, so the, the auto-scaling context uh, is still there, but we're not triggering off of the solometer uh, alerts and alarms. I mean, you can, you can auto-scale by sending straight, you know, curling straight to the API, but the, the triggered auto-scaling with solometer doesn't exist. What customers do are either have triggers that reach out and look at uh, ClickD or Monit or they're using something outside. I mean, that's a, uh, it's a good point. It is a gap, but it was a sacrifice we had to make until Solometer's, uh, you know, mature enough to scale to the hundred, to, you know, to, to the level that we need it to, to do. Um, so that was the, that was the, that was the trade-off that we had to make uh, for that. Now we are contributing code uh, back up to Trunk to write a Slometer wrapper for um, Graphite. So that's Slometer, you can talk to Slometer API on the back end instead of Slometer talking to SQL, it's talking to Graphite. Um, so, so in the Cisco broadcast domain, all the um, autoscaling is done via heat. Um, in the Cisco broadcast domain. SPVSS. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, so MetaCloud, um, I don't know if you're with Cisco or not, but Okay, <laughs> thanks for the, <laughs> I appreciate the, the loaded question. Uh, so, um, 
we've got verticals in Cisco, right? We've got uh, Mercury and CIS and UCSO and MetaCloud. Testing on the SPVSS, they did use heat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, SPVSS testing with MetaCloud did use heat, but it wasn't automatically triggered, so we obviously don't have Solometer. Uh, we have a fusion project uh, to bring those, uh, explain my straight man in the back, making me uncomfortable in, uh, making me explain a little more about the portfolio. Um, so part of the fusion project was moving from Canonical to, to Red Hat. Uh, the other part was taking um, bespoke, you know, versions of, of OpenStack and bringing together a collaborative effort, uh, right, with, between CIS and uh, Mercury, uh, which is non-prem um, version of, uh, of OpenStack and MetaCloud. Uh, so, um, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. So I can, I can speak to Seth. Um, he can probably answer the, the SolidFire question. I know we've got multiple production deploys of, of SolidFire. Um, and it, uh, that's some crazy feedback. It's the plate in my head or something. Um, uh, Seth, uh, about a petabyte uh, raw. Now we moved from the, um, when we moved to the I release, um, we're getting a little more forgiving uh, around that. We have a CVD on how many, um, spindles we put in versus how many SSDs we put in, all that kind of stuff. But around a petabyte raw, around 350T uh, was our standard before we went to the I release of, of Ceph. So that's, we're going to probably be a little bit more flexible and forgiving on, on that. Um, is, is that with the hyperconverged that on the model, the Ceph? The, the only deployment of Ceph we do is hyperconverged. We do no centralized Ceph. Um, so uh, either. Uh, if we have multiple hundred nodes, we'll decrease the number of drives, drive count or drive size um, to, to fit in that one petabyte of, of raw. And again, with the iRelease, uh, we're going to be a little bit more forgiving uh, with that. Um, or we, you know, in a 30-node th cluster with eight 4T drives. Um, do, you know, do you happen to know what our largest solid fire deployment is? It's large. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay. We're going to have to cut this one short. Everybody, we have another session starting in about, oh, five minutes. So um, we do have a drawing for each session today. I think you probably got a little card as you came in the door. Um, if you want to fill that out, we're going to toss them in the bucket. We have a very cool, should be better prepared for this, Philips Bluetooth speaker that we'd like to give out to somebody here today. So. If you want to fill out those cards and, I don't know, send them to the end of the aisle, 